at first when I was being hired for it, wow, uh, what is this, you know, Canadian consultant guy going to do with NASA? These are rocket scientists. But when I got there, I realized they have a lot of the same problems that any organization have, which is that um, uh, they're all working in very different perspectives. And the way that, that I would put it is that uh, imagine you have a biologist, you have a chemist, and you have a rocket scientist. All three of them are the best in the world in their field, but they all have a different choice of how they want to get to Mars. The biologist wants to get human life there. That's billions of dollars in 25 years. The rocket scientist just wants to go and plant a flag to beat China. That costs uh, less money, but takes eight years. And the uh, chemist just wants to retrieve some space rock, which maybe takes 15 years. But oddly, none of those three missions uh, can actually all succeed or well, if you pick just one only one of them can work hi i'm james taylor business creativity and innovation keynote speaker and this is the creative life a show dedicated to you the creative if you're looking for motivation inspiration and advice while at home at work or on your daily commute then this show is for you each episode brings you a successful creative whether that's an author musician entrepreneur performer designer or thought leader They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have on the show Jeremy Gutche. Jeremy Gutche, MBA, CFA, is a New York Times bestselling author, an award-winning innovation expert, sought-after keynote speaker, and the CEO of Trend Hunter, the world's number one innovation website with 200,000 ID hunters and 3 billion views from 150 million visitors. Prior to Trend Hunter, Jeremy grew a $1 billion portfolio for a bank, and today over 600 brands and CEOs rely on his speeches, including Google, Disney, Starbucks, Netflix, Coca-Cola, and IBM. He's even helped NASA prototype the journey to Mars. He has been described as an intellectual can of Red Bull, which I think is fantastic, and his latest book is called Create the Future, Tactics for Disruptive Thinking. It's my great pleasure to have Jeremy with us today. So welcome, Jeremy. Well, thanks so much for having me on The Creative Life. So share with us all what's happening in your world at the moment. Uh, well, the world is going into a period of chaos, as you no doubt can see. And uh, on one hand, there's a lot of doom and gloom with that. But on the other hand, this is, uh, I guess, what, what my uh, company and my experience, my life has been specialized in. In, in 2008, I, I had written a book called Exploiting Chaos, which was all about how chaos actually creates opportunity. And People listening to the creative life, it's a, it's a unique concept that might not be totally unfamiliar, but the bubonic plague led to the Renaissance period. In times of recession, we saw the founding of Apple, Google, uh, Fortune Magazine, Hewlett Packard, FedEx, Burger King, Uber, uh, all sorts of interesting things happen in these times of chaos because they break us out of the rut of repeating whatever led to last year's decision. They cause us to try new things, explore and experiment, and they cause us to be more creative. So uh, on one hand, it's a, an awkward time and an intimidating time, but on the other hand, we're entering the most creative period ever. And uh, my new book, Create the Future, was a, a two-sided book with one side being a total rewrite of that chaos book and the other side being all about change in, in times of chaos. So. Uh, this is a this is a time where everyone in my company is all in trying to figure out how to help people navigate this wild time of chaos. Well, it's, it's certainly a very timely. But where, where did your your fascination for innovation come from? When did it all begin for you? All I ever wanted to do was be an entrepreneur. I mean, as a kid, I had a dad that was a serial entrepreneur with all the ups and downs an entrepreneur has. Had some wild stories of being a boy businessman, and so I wanted to be a boy businessman when I was just a little kid. And so actually, I had this creative exercise where when I grew up, he would buy every magazine in each category. It could be on cars, trucks, fishing, boats, really didn't matter. And, and then we would sit down and we would flip to the sections in that magazine with new innovations. And we'd go through each one and he'd say, what do you think about this? What about that? What about this? What if we were to make this? How much would the parts cost if we went to garage sales and bought used parts? And how would we sell it? How would we price it? And so I had a life growing up of wanting to be an entrepreneur so bad, of practicing and testing ideas so much that uh, on one hand, I knew that's what I wanted to do, something creative. 
But on the other side, I sort of felt overwhelmed. How do you pick when there are so many different choices out there? So that led me to the world of corporate innovation where I thought I would get my idea. I still didn't. So then back in 2005, before YouTube and before Facebook, I coded Trend Hunter as a place for people around the world to share ideas. And truthfully, I thought maybe some trend hunter from Scotland or a trend hunter from South America might submit the little idea that would inspire me. And what I didn't realize is that lots of us are looking for our creative inspiration. So the traffic went from thousands to millions to billions. And so from a, a sort of company perspective, we flipped trend hunter on its head. And on the front page, you can get inspiration. But on the back, we started working with hundreds of brands to sort of filter the insight we're seeing to help people get their inspiration. So that's my world and uh, kind of brings you up to speed, I guess, with how I got into the world of innovation in some ways by accident, really just by being a kid searching for his idea. Now, it's, it's a fascinating business trend. I'm, I'm always intrigued when I kind of go on the site and I see all the, the things you've, you've kind of got going on there. I know you do events, you do kind of innovation uh, days all around the world as well. When you're working with your, your different clients um, and also individuals, what do you find holds them back from really achieving that kind of innovation potential that, that they all have? Well, we get caught in a rut of uh, uh, repeating past decisions. And um, actually, when I wrote Create the Future it, as a two-sided book, the first side was meant to be the part I think I missed when I'd written my first book 12 years ago, which was that you can have all the creative innovation frameworks you want, but the reality is the more successful a person gets, the more successful an organization gets, the more they get stuck in their ways of wanting to repeat what happened before. So I'd written the first side there, the Create the Future side, to be strictly about disruptive thinking versus path dependency. And path dependency is really interesting. It's a psychological concept from the 1950s. And if you apply today's innovation and chaos world, it's, it's quite applicable because the concepts are that um, the better you get at anything, the more you want to stay stuck in the path and you start missing out on the reality that there are so many other paths you could take, so many different decisions you could make, but we stick with a safe choice and for a variety of factors we miss out. So when it comes to larger organizations you work with, how, what are some ways that they can use to kind of knock them out into that, that, uh, that dependent way of, of, of building a business, just being happy with the way, well, this is the way it's always happened. This is the way that we should continue. It maybe we'll do some, uh, you know, incremental innovation, but we don't want to rock the boat. How do you, how do you start to kind of move them out? Is, is it a culture thing or is it a, a, a systems or a process or is it really st strategic? It's cultural and it's mindset. And I like to start by really walking through what the seven traps of path dependency are to illuminate to people where they're held back. And they involve things like the subtlety of disruptive ideas and the way new things seem awkward, especially to smart people who've been in that market. The traps of success, the ease of inaction, our neurological shortcuts. But what I like to do is sort of walk people through examples to show them where their brain uh, holds them back from the right creative solution. And when you go through a series of examples, you start to realize, oh, wow, that's, you know, my neurological traps are impacting me more than I thought. And then you can start to introduce new concepts. But I think it starts with the self-awareness of recognizing how our own traps blind us individually from the great ideas within our grasp. And you start rolling that up to an organization and you start realizing how, how all these things compound and how we then can miss out on, on great ideas, which is why so many uh, successful companies end up getting disrupted. But even if they're not disrupted, so many have also just missed out on the ideas that were so close within their grasp. So you're almost kind of pulling on things like behavioral science then and those kind of like nudge factors and, and uh, other things that we kind of, we, we, we start to recognize a lot more now and think, well, how does that play into the culture of an organization? Yeah, you know, it's funny. We all exhibit resistance to change at different levels. And like, I love, love the little simple examples you can do in the world. But one is, you know, you, who types? You type, I type, we all type. And the keyboard layout we have is a, um, a QWERTY keyboard. And you can look at your keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. That's how it's laid out. Got it. And that's interesting, but that keyboard layout comes from a uh, hundred years ago when no, the, like very few of us typed, maybe 0.1% of people in the organization. And that layout was made so that the keys don't mash together when you hit the keys at the same time. There's a better layout. It's called a Dvorak keyboard, and every key on your keyboard is laid in a different spot. 
and it's laid out for an optimal setup in a digital world where we all type. You could switch your phone right now if you'd like, and you will stumble around for the next six months. But after typing on your phone with a different layout, typing on your keyboard with a different layout, in about six months of stumbling around, you will emerge 20 or 30% faster. Cool. Do you want to switch your keyboard layout right now? No. Right? None no. of us do. And it's, yeah, no, no way. No, Not going to no. do it. But yet, I just gave you a way that after just a few months of time, you could be better by 20%. It's something you do every single day, but we don't want to do it. And the reality is we all exhibit a level of resistance to change at different levels. When it's not our job or our, or our department, we don't want to change. It's easier to say no to things. And you just start adding that up in so many different areas. And you can see how creative ideas don't often get the love they deserve. And that doesn't even account for the fact that creative ideas start off much more awkward because they're not as polished as the thing you've done a hundred times in a row. So sometimes the, these things are also there's a there's a timing kind of component. It's it, it's it's right, but just not right now. It, it, things need to. Evolve. I mean, we're seeing obviously just now. Uh, it's funny because I, I remember years ago and living in California and trying to convince uh, universities about going online and offering more of their courses and things online, and it was a real battle <laughs> with a lot of them. And it's fascinating watching some sure. of the universities that were have been talking about it for 15 years and not doing anything about it. And then suddenly in the space of two weeks, they're going online overnight. So it was, it was like a time it needed that push it needed something, maybe an externality to push them to doing something. Yeah. And the timing is a very interesting trap because what happens in organizations is one of the reasons that large companies get disrupted or miss out on big ideas is that those new concepts are too close to something they already tested but maybe too early, so they dismissed it. If I take Smith Corona, uh, I'd written about that a lot in the first book, Exploiting Chaos, and I kind of brought it back in a different form this time. But what was interesting about Smith Corona is they invented laptop word processors, grammar checkers, spell checkers, saving to a disk. In 1990, they had computers on shelves in stores. But by 1991, the world went in a global economic recession. At head office, they panicked and they said, you know, these computers are kind of quirky and they're, they're just not our main product. They're not going to be for a while. We're really good at typewriters. Everyone doing computers, come back to head office and we'll get back to that project in, you know, several years if it turns around. I don't know. Three years later, Smith Kerner declares bankruptcy. And the joint venture partner, Acer, whom they abandoned, becomes the second largest PC maker in the world. And when you start diving into it, whether it's Smith Corona or Xerox and the personal computer or Kodak and the digital camera, what happens is that in the beginning, the market leader gets into and often invents an entire industry. It just looks awkward well, relative to their super polished business. And then it's too easy every time it comes up again in a meeting to be like, oh, we tried that. It doesn't work. We tried that. It doesn't work. And then by the time they want to get into it, it's too late. So being good and trying something too early can be a trap because then you miss out on uh, that new idea's emergence because it's so easy to say we tried that before. Now, we're in a time just now where a lot of companies are obviously almost in survival if you're in, the, say, the travel or the airline industry. Um, but many other companies are kind of moving from this even the space of survival into the, okay, how do we thrive in this new, in this new era, this new epoch that we're, we're kind of going into? Um, what techniques do you use for kind of identifying opportunities faster than, than maybe other competitors out there? Because like one of the things I, I always watch, you know, watching other speakers, other kind of thought leaders on innovation, you're always, there, you're always kind of pushing kind of right at the edge. Um, and I'm always interested in like in terms of your own personal kind of thought process, what, what do you use to kind of identify those opportunities that you're going to go after? And what, what do you advise your clients to, to do? Sure. So, I mean, it starts with a pretty intense focus on what's the real, the hardcore end problem they're solving. So we take the Smith Crown example. They were the best typewriter company in the world and they were trying to maintain that. But if they thought of the customer experience, well, they were actually helping people record human thought. So you'd start off with that broader, uh, more end user focused problem. But then when you get in the problem, the core of uh, my methodology is about trying to break you from the path and recognizing that you keep clinging to the solution that you see. So what we try to do is break you out of that uh, with, uh, with that's effectively trend hunters business by showing you your opportunities from multiple angles and getting you to go through the experience of 
what could lead to your company's disruption? If we destroyed it and rebuilt it, what would happen? How would different competitors approach your market? If Amazon oddly got into your market, even though you never thought they would, just like they did with Whole Foods, how would they approach your market? What about Patagonia who only cares about sustainability? And yeah, I could go on and on. The point though is not about um, the specific examples I'm saying. It's the technique of trying to break the problem apart and look at it from multiple perspectives in order to get out of all of those traps that keep you path dependent and not realizing uh, the, the alternative routes and alternative paths that you could actually attain. It, it reminds me, there's a, there's a story, I think it's a Hindu uh, mythology. They talk about, uh, the, the three blind men, um, uh, each is uh, each is considered a guru, an expert, and uh, there's this new beast that comes into the village, uh, and, and um, an elephant, and one of them goes up and he feels he feels the the, the leg of the of the elephant and said, oh, this is this is this is a this is a, a pillar that we're, I'm talking about here. This is a pillar that I can feel here. Another one says, oh, I, I can feel a I can feel a wing. There's a leathery type of wing that flaps back and forth and another one says i i, I you know I, I can feel this this kind of thing this this kind of uh this fluffy thing at the end I, i'm not you know and they all kind of come and none of them speak to each other because all of them believe that they hold the the truth <laughs> this it's the pillar it's the wing it's the such because none of them will as you were saying they're willing to kind of break the problem apart to to look at it from different perspectives rather than their own perspectives actually see actually it, it wasn't what we thought at all we we're we're kind of we're we're going after the truth in the wrong way sure well the, the other issue that that uh that parable brings up is the reality that in so many organizations uh, whatever creative role you might have you're often focused on a smaller part of the bigger problem and then different groups compete for resources they don't necessarily communicate things get siloed and then we lose hold of what the overall mission is so actually one of the other workshops i like to do which i i, I outlined um sort of step by step in the book uh is really trying to bring groups together to collide and, and co-create the future and i had a really cool experience of doing that a couple times with nasa where i worked on prototyping the journey to mars which was like a wow what a boyhood fantasy of a project from my perspective but um, and I also thought well, at first when I was being hired for it, wow, uh, what is this you know, Canadian consultant guy going to do with NASA? These are rocket scientists. But when I got there, I realized they have a lot of the same problems that any organization have, which is that um, uh, they're all working in very different perspectives. And the way that, that I would put it is that uh, imagine you have a biologist, you have a chemist, and you have a rocket scientist. All three of them are the best in the world in their field, but they all have a different choice of how they want to get to Mars. The biologist wants to get human life there. That's billions of dollars in 25 years. The rocket scientist just wants to go and plant a flag to beat China. That costs uh, less money, but takes eight years. And the uh, chemist just wants to retrieve some space rock, which maybe takes 15 years. But oddly, none of those three missions uh, can actually all succeed or if you pick just one only one of them can work so then what, what the whole workshops were were bringing everyone together to co-create the future and what was interesting is normally they would apply for their grants and get individual success in their careers and stay focused just on the next milestone and they don't ever actually get to talk about getting to mars at a high level you just go do your experiments in a back room well, when we brought everyone together and we run through a series of exercises where they start realizing what happens if things go wrong, then it forces them to realize how they have to play together. They realize that um, they're actually going to be headed for failure uh, and you can paint that picture out. And I'll skip ahead a little bit because what I liked was in the end, the act of destroying and rebuilding led the groups to realize a couple things. Uh, they realized if you don't, uh, an astronaut stood up and he said, if you don't get your project approved and done in eight years, you'll see it canceled and you'll get fired and lose your job. Everyone laughed. He goes, no, I've been on 17 missions that were canceled and I realized eight years is the magic number because every time the president changes, they cancel all the missions to Mars. <laughs> and so you need to get your work done in eight years or you lose presidential support and you're done. Now, the room chilled. And he realized how different things were on this giant long-term project and how they'd have to play nice together if they want incremental career success. So they went through all these simulations that they normally wouldn't get to talk about or do. The end goal really being that they learn to collaborate more. But my favorite 
presentation at the end was one group got up and they said, hey, we've got the answer. And you're going to laugh at us. You will. You'll laugh at us. You'll say it's impractical. But by the end, you'll realize we're geniuses. And everyone paid attention. And they said, our answer, laugh if you will, is space beer. Here's why space beer works. Because we need to get a rocket to, the, to Mars so the rocket scientist is happy. We then need to harness the water that's there so the biologist is happy, or the, sorry, the chemist is happy. Then we need to try and grow a little plant so the biologist is happy. And then we need to see if we can, you know, do a little experiment to make beer. But with every level that we do this, we harness water on water to get closer to America brewing beer. Social media will go wild. We'll get more support at every little step. And by the end of it, you try being the American president that cancels America's mission to brew beer on Mars. Anyway, <laughs> it's a long, fun story of creativity, but one of my favorite projects I've ever been a part of. Uh, they got a, a mission worth worth uh, living for. Um, you 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 are known as obviously as a trend hunter. But in the book, you actually talk about trend hunting. But you also talk about, about trend farming as well. Um, which, as as I'm talking to you just now, I'm looking out into these beautiful green fields here. So, what is the difference between trend hunting and trend farming? Uh, well, I mean, largely the, the, there's a lot of difference between hunting and farming and that when you're hunting, you're going out and you're really trying to pursue what's on the edge. And uh, when you're farming, you're really trying to collect ideas and, and, and cultivate what you have and, and effectively try to see what's emerging that you can take advantage of in a more methodical way. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. Because I, I was just interested in, in those, those different areas. Um, and this kind of come back to you, yourself a little bit more here as well. In all this, obviously, you've got the trend hunter site, all these amazing uh, ideas that are getting passed through, innovations that are getting passed through that. In, in terms of your own life and your own creative process, are there any online resources or tools or apps you find particularly useful, either in, in collecting your ideas or you know, when, you, when you have something or kind of working on your ideas? Well, I mean, I try not to explicitly uh, plug Trend Hunter in a certain way, but I had built Trend Hunter as a place for people from around to the world to share business ideas. And at this point, we have a couple hundred thousand contributors. So it's a community. So I don't feel bad about then uh, showcasing their lovely work. And uh, we've, we've featured about half a million ideas in every category from design to fashion, tech, and pop culture. So personally, I do definitely spend a lot of time on Trend Hunter, and you'll find me lurking about, commenting, checking on things, and looking for you know my my next little inspiration there. And then personally, when it comes to my work and trying to come up with book ideas, I really just every time I I see something inspiring, I very quickly email it to myself, just using a little uh, uh, header codes so that I can search all my notes later, just an e email because I really don't want to have delay when I think about an idea. Um, and then I have a process where I kind of just go over stuff again and again and again, trying to find the perfect storyline or thread that, that makes sense or helps me look at a problem from a different perspective. Nice. And if you were to recommend one book to our listeners, not your own book, but a book by another author you find either particularly inspiring or, or one, maybe a book you've gifted more often than others, what would that book be? And also an album. You're in, you're in Canada land of some of the greatest songwriters and musicians in the world what would that what would that <laughs> album be you'd recommend so what would the, the book and the album be well the, i mean the book that i always loved the most is a book that's a very unique recommendation but it's called uh it's not how good you are it's how good you want to be and it's by paul uh, arden who was actually the chief uh, creative officer for Saatchi and Saatchi for many years. And uh, below it, the subtitle is The World's Best Selling Book by Paul, Paul Arden, as in <laughs> the only book by Paul Arden. That's, uh, I remember that, but it's, it's, so, a, it's a very small little book as well. It's a beautiful little it's book. It's a small little book and it's half imagery, uh, but it's a rereadable book that um, is actually what, what inspired me to make my first book, Exploding Chaos, half imagery, because I remember we received that book in our MBA program and then. Uh, years later, you know, that was the same year that Good to Great was a big book and all this stuff. But years later, I look on all the coffee tables of all my fellow you know, classmates and, and, and I'd see not Good to Great, but rather this book from Paul Arden. And it's because it's just a handy little pick me up to open and flip through and look at the titles and get inspired. So I love that book because it's rereadable and you can kind of grab it from any page and, and dive in. So that would be my favorite book that I've, I've given more than any other. And then what about the music? What would the album be? 
Part two on an album is difficult for a guy like me. The short attention span of a guy from trendhunter.com means my, uh, my views on music are always changing and I'm bored and looking for the next big thing at any given time. So for me, it's usually a, a Spotify channel where I've got whatever the latest thing is that I've heard, but I, I let the algorithm show me what it recommends next just to try and keep on the edge of, of what's next. So I couldn't be repetitive enough to name you one album, even though I do, do love listening to new songs all the time. And then Jeremy, let's imagine you wake up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch. So you've got all the, the tools of your trade, all the knowledge you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you and you know no one. What would you do? How would you restart things? Well, I think the lesson that I feel I've learned over a couple decades of searching so relentlessly for my idea and then, and then finding it is um, that in the early days, I would look for business ideas and filter business ideas and evaluate them by thinking, oh, how much money can you make from this? Is there a market opportunity? And kind of approaching things like that. But now I realize it's so much more important to have passion and not in a cliche way of saying, oh, you, you know, you love playing guitar, dedicate your life to the guitar. But it's thinking about what types of things do you like? Do you like solving a certain type of problem? What are those activities? And then really trying to choose something that you are passionate enough that it doesn't necessarily feel like work, that you love solving that type of problem. So for me, it's sort of futurism and looking at problems from different perspectives and trying to solve difficult problems uh, with non-traditional ways. And so if I was starting again, that's what I would do. But the bigger takeaway would be if you start an idea or a career or a new company, just recognize that even if you think you were going to flip something in two or three years, you probably don't. It probably becomes your career and one decision leads to many others. So pick something that you'll just love solving the problems in uh, for as long as you possibly can. Well, Jeremy, it's been great having you on the show. Where is the best place for people to go to learn more about the book, uh, learn more about you and all the other work you're doing just now? Well, the easiest place is to go to trendhunter.com. And there you can find all sorts of resources about our trends, our mega trends, our frameworks, lots of free tools like our new 2020 report. Today, we put out a report on the, uh, the new normal in, a, in the world post COVID-19. So that's all free. And you can find info there about Create the Future, which is uh, at Amazon or bookstores everywhere. Well, uh, Create the Future Tactics for Disruptive Change is now out. So uh, uh, thank you, Jeremy, so much for coming on the show today and for sharing with us all about your creative life. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I love the mission at The Creative Life. So keep it up. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.